So on my <coughs> so on my way out to the range today, uh, as I was pulling all my stuff out of the truck, throwing it on the firing point, a buddy of mine was leaving the range. I stopped and talked to him. You know, he talked about guns, talked about this, talked about that. And uh, you see, you want to see my new rig? I said, yeah, let's see it. And uh, pulled it out. Saco Finlight and 300 mag. Okay, that in and of, of itself is impressive. Beautiful rifle. Beautiful rifle. Stainless pencil barrel with fluting and beautiful rifle. But then I realized it's got a Huskama scope on it. This thing's got to be worth at least $4,000 retail. He said, I can take a target out 400 meters, no problem. 500 meters, I'm starting to, well, I feel pretty confident. And uh, I said, you want to see what I got? He said, yeah. So I got a $175 Lee Enfield. So I felt a little bit inadequate. However, Lee Enfield has its purpose. It's got its applications. And in many respects, the Lee Enfield is better Psycho Finlay with a Huskama scope on it. Let the flaming commence. So essentially, uh, what we're going to do today is zero this rifle. This here is a Sporterly Enfield that I picked up for $175. And the reason why I decided that I was going to pick this particular rifle is because the tube on it is really good. It's got an excellent barrel. All of the numbers matching. The uh, it has been refurbished at one point in time. Somebody has taken the uh, the care and attention to actually reblue it. Um, which generally it's not the reason why I buy a rifle, but uh, generally if somebody is going to reblue a rifle, it's something because they're taking care of it. And um, I don't think they're trying to hide anything because they're selling it as a sporter. <laughs> I mean, look at the uh, look at the muzzle. I've taken off the end and removed the bayonet lugs, recrowned it, and I did a nice job, and then reblued everything. It's all matching parts. This thing was manufactured in 1943 by Maltby and refurbished uh, by the Royal Ordnance Factory. It is not a number 4 Mark I, two. It is a number 4 Mark I. Uh, number 4 Mark I slash 2 means that it has been um, reconditioned so that the trigger hangs from the receiver rather than being part of the trigger guard. Okay, so I may be talking mumbo-jumbo to a bunch of you out there that aren't too terribly familiar with the Enfields, but just know that there was a process where they did that. Okay, so anyways, um, I, uh, okay, so I'm into it for 175 bucks, but it doesn't shoot. Uh, I did my own uh, complete 100% teardown, inspected all the components and parts to make sure it was there weren't any cracks in the receiver area and so on. I mean, you want to make sure that things are safe. It's kind of one of the responsibilities of being a gun owner, right? It's, it's mosquitoes out where I am. You got to make sure it's safe to shoot. I head spaced it, made sure all of that was good to go. It is, it's good to go. Um, so now we need to get into function test and zeroing. And there's a process to go into. I'm going to try to describe that for you. Uh, but before we do so, one of the first things you need to do when, when you've got these rifles and you're going to take it out and you're going to zero it. Make sure you flip up your rear sight and you set it to 200 yards. That's where that's the basis point. That's where we're going to start. That's how this formula works. Now, if you have a target that's in between uh, you and 200 meters, let's say he's at 75 meters, or he's at 100 meters. Um, generally, you're not going to set down your sights. You'll just aim off. If you're in target shooting, there's yeah, okay, I I will. I'll, I'll set my sights down. But generally, a couple clicks should do it. Um, at, two, at 200 meters, you're zeroed. At 100 meters, you're printing about three to four inches high. No big deal. It's no big deal. But for the purpose of zeroing this rifle, we started at a setting of 200 yards. Okay, this here is an aperture sight, or what I like to call a vernier sight. And there's a little dial at the top here, and you can, you can move your ladder up and down, bring it back down. Number of clicks, I believe they're half a minute of angle clicks, I'd have to double check that. I'll annotate it if it's different. Um, there, this is called the number one, it's called the Mark I sight. Okay, these are the sights to have. 
for those of you that are in competition, if you don't have one of these sites, you might as well go home. If you're running a ladder site, one of the Canadian or other manufacturer uh, Mark III sites with the ladder, okay, uh, you might as well just go home and not bother with the competition because you'd be shooting up to 500 meters. Just go home. In some cases, 600 meters. The new uh, Canadian Forces Small Arms Concentration uh, match goes out to 600 meters for Rangers that are shooting it. Uh, if you're not running a vernier site, you're not going to be successful. You may do okay, but you very unlikely you're going to be on the podium. Um, I'll go into that a little bit. Um, now the reason for that is, and I should probably put a bit of a context on that, uh, the reason why I'm saying the the Mark 1 site is the way to go if you're in competition is because in Canada we work on metric ranges. In the United States are still running imperial ranges in yards. We work in meters here in Canada. We have done so since I think 1978. That's a long time. Um, and we're a metric, we work in metric here in, uh, in Canada. Okay, these sites are, are in yards. All of the sites are in yards. That was the that was the measurement um, convention of the day, yards, imperial. And when you're shooting on a metric range, you don't just dial up to the range that's indicated on your on your on your rear sight here and expect that that's actually where you're going to be printing. Okay, so that's one thing to take into consideration. You're going to be shooting in metric ranges, 100 meters, 200 meters, 300 meter firing points, and so on. Um, to know that. Secondly, these sights were calibrated for the Mark 7 uh, round. 303 British Mark 7 round. You may be able to find some of that somewhere in the, in the surplus store, you know, some of the old cordite ammunition. However, it's very unlikely that you're going to find that. Um, if you're running, um, if you're if you're a ranger, you're issue, shooting issued ammunition is Mark 8Z ammunition. So you're running a different formulation and a different weight of bullet than the Mark 7 ammunition. Uh, 174 grains, flat base, full metal jacket, this is the Mark 7, at 2,440 feet per second, plus or minus 40 feet per second. That was the convention for this rear sight. They all are. The Ranger ammunition that we're shooting is at 175, not 174, 175 grain full metal jacket boat tail, which means that the ass end of it is rounded off a bit. Um, so it's a heavier bullet, running at a slower velocity, just over 2,300 feet per second. So you're going to be getting a lot more bullet drop with the ammunition, with the 8Z ammunition, the Mark 8Z. Um, so don't expect that, you know, once you're zero, that these range ind indicators are going to be accurate. That's where the Vernier set comes, uh, comes into play here, because you're going to have a custom setting. So that you know exactly where your point of impact is going to be in all, all those different ranges. Ultimately, you can tape them how many clicks you need in order to get the specific range you're trying to acquire a target at. Tape it to your rifle. But ultimately, for the for, for competition, you memorize them. They're all in, in the noodle. You don't have to look down. Okay, so at uh, the 400 meters, zero is plus 14 click. No, you know it. It's up here. If you're in competition. You have to have it memorized. There's going to be so many things going on to interrupt your train of thought. And if you don't have that information down, you're just adding another layer to the formula of confusion that we all go through when we're in a service rifle competition or match. You know, I'm getting a little bit off topic. But it does, you know, just, just one more thing. Um, when we're out, we're zeroing these rifles. Uh, it's, it's going to be very, very important that we're we're entertaining, we're adopting the philosophies and the me mechanisms and techniques of surgical precision accuracy. All right, we're not, we're not out there just bang off ammunition. Right? We're going to try to make every single round count. If you're unable to do that, you will not be able to discern. Your groups are going to be open. Right? And how do you find out how many, uh, how to adjust your sights if you don't really have a reference point as to what the size of your groups are? So make. Oh, so use sandbags, use a bench rest, get the most stable platform to shoot these groups when we're zeroing as you can. 
you sandbags. I like the three-point sandbag with the sandbag underneath the buttstock here. A small sandbag that I can squeeze to adjust for, for, for vertical side alignment. Um, I will be out there shooting in the prone unsupported position, A, because I need the practice, uh, B, feel fairly confident in my shooting ability at, those, at the distances we're going to be using today, and C, I find that Lee and Fields shoot differently when he shoots them off the sandbag. I'm just saying. It's, it's, a, it's a minuscule amount. Um, however, when you're in the prone, unsupported, sitting, kneeling, standing, um, using deliberate or the, the best kind of, I'm adopting principles of surgical precision, taking my time, making every shot uh, count, I find that the rifle shoots differently holding it in my hands. And for consistency of applications, um, I feel more confident zeroing these rifles shooting in the prone unsupported position. It's the most, it's the steadiest position. And really, I'm not getting a heck of a lot more accuracy um, by using sandbags than shooting in the prone unsupported. But that's me. That's how I rock and roll. And you might be different. I'd encourage you to uh, to use sandbags if you're if you're if you're not an accomplished shooter. If you are an accomplished shooter, don't use sandbags. This is a fairly simple process. We're only shooting at 25 yards. You should be able to determine where your group average is. All right, just wanted to put that point in. Um, we'll be zeroing the rifle today, and uh, the proper zero for the Lee Enfield rifle is 200 meters. And the way we do that is not simply by changing our rear sight setting. We do that by setting our rear sight to 200 yards and uh, we'll swap out the front sight until we, uh, we actually get to what we're aiming at. So the front sight here, we're going to swap that out until we get to where we need to be. And there's a formula at foot here. We start at 25 yards with a one inch by one and a half inch square, taller than wider. Uh, and we aim at the base of that. And the ultimate goal here is uh, to arrive at the center of group is about 0.75 inches higher than where you're aiming. Your point of impact is 0.75 inches higher than your point of aim. Okay? Uh, and we're going to swap out the front sights until we get to there. And we'll go into the process uh, in some level of detail for you. Here we are at 25 meters. Um, this group here is obviously low. We're aiming at the six o'clock position of this uh, of this square here, which is about one and a half to you know by tall and about one meter across. Sorry, one inch across, one and a half inches tall. Um, the objective here is to try to get this group to cluster at about 0.75 inches above the point of aim, in order to get our 200 yard zero. So right about there. Not worried about horizontal at this point in time, just for just vertical. So we're going to swap out this front sight. If we're shooting too low, it means we have a, our front sight is too tall. So we have to shorten her up. At 25 meters, each one of these sights is about 0 0.015 inches shorter or taller than the next size. And by moving it up and down by 0 0.015 inches, we will move this group by half an inch. Therefore, center of this one here, we're looking at a, at least three sizes smaller than the size that's on there now, which currently is a point 
0.030. You will see that these, um, a lot of these rifles, sorry, but this, somebody sporterized this, the end field here and, uh, and taken the, the end of the, uh, the barrel off here, recrowned it. It did a nice job, mind you. Um, but you will see here on this front sight that there is a little uh, front sight tensioner, okay? Uh, these front sight tools are really difficult to find, so all you need to do is get yourself an old-fashioned screwdriver that's worn out or whatever, cut the end off, and uh, using your Dremel cutting edge, you can just cut yourself a bit of a groove. Whether you can see that or not. Cut yourself a bit of a groove so you can actually tighten that, because some sights are slightly loose inside these uh, the dovetail that goes in here. So having something like this would become useful to you. When and if you need to make fine adjustments to your, uh, uh, right now we're just swatch, swap, swapping out front sights to adjust for vertical. But if you need to adjust for horizontal, you need to get yourself one of these. And this here is, uh, there are various other versions of it uh, out there, but this is one of the originals. You can see the Seabroad Arrow stamp on it, the manufacturer stamp on it here. Um, but these tools are very, very good for making fine adjustments. You get your scribe, you know where you are, and you make your increments in, in one thirty seconds of an inch. At 25 yards will give you a half inch uh, variation of um, horizontal on target for point of impact. Okay, so it doesn't need to be very much. You just make the adjustment, keep the, uh, the tension screw under tension, don't loosen it for this part. Only loosen it to remove the sight and uh, put another one back on. And then you're good to go. But as I'm only just uh, uh, getting the the front sight to where I need uh, vertically. I'm not really too worried about the horizontal right now. So eyeball it, it's good enough. Okay, let's go try it again here. See what happens. Okay, here's target number two. As you can see, the uh, the group, I blew one. I know, okay, we're only at 25 yards rifle chair. How come you're not putting them into one one whole groups? I never said I was that great a shooter. However, um, you will notice that generally the, uh, the group has come up. There's a cluster of four rounds. Um, again, I'm not worried about um, horizontal at this point in time, just vertical. So it's where I want it. It's in between kind of a quarter inch to an inch and a quarter, uh, 0.75 being the average. Um, now I'm now zeroed for 200 yards. I'm gonna, so basically what we need to do is um, set up a target at 100 meters. My group should be about three to four inches high um, at that point in time. Just kind of confirmation that I should be on target for 200 meters. I'm doing this uh, in the prone, unsupported position, which means that, uh, you know, so I, I'm introducing some error into my groups. This ideally should be done off sandbags, off a rest. You know, you should be putting a, a lot of emphasis on precision at this point in time. And I think that for the, uh, uh, I'm going to continue to shoot in the prone, unsupported position because that's simply just practice for me. And it's something I want to get better at. So um, that's why I'm going to proceed. I hope I don't embarrass myself for the next set of area videos. Okay, moving right along. We're 10 rounds into it and we're almost there. I am going to make a bit of an adjustment with the sights now because we're shooting to the left. And when you're making an adjustment to your front sights, if you're shooting to the left, you move the front sight from the left. And that's looking fr um, uh, from, the, from the back end of the rifle, looking towards the front. If um, I will be moving the front sight to the left. And again, um, about a 30 second of an inch will give me a half, half, uh, half an inch adjustment at 25 yards. Um, but I'm again, I'm just going to eyeball it because I, I can see that the front side is, is pretty much off from shooting this last group. We'll make the adjustments and come back. Okay, so the adjustments are made. I'm pretty much roughed in, moving out to 100 meters again. Another five shots. The barrel is starting to get hot after this one. I'll let it cool down for a little while before we uh, reevaluate.
Okay, so at this point in time, uh, we're just making our way out to the 100 meter uh, target mount. And I'm bringing the rifle with me because trying to remember what your sight setting should be when you get back to the firing point can be, well, you just enter that gray world. It's a lot easier when you would get up to the target, bring your front sight tool with you, bring the rifle with you, walk out to the 100 meter uh, target mount, have a look at where you're printing, make the side adjustment, the front side adjustment left to the right right there on the spot don't try to remember where you left off after you patched your targets once you get back to the firing point just another opportunity to introduce error so we're going to try to avoid that okay okay so here's the 100 meter target five rounds uh, there's a total of five rounds in this group one two three four five um, point of aim is right here uh, the objective is to get about between three to four inches high at 100 meters. And I'm not gonna make any more sight adjustments. I'm 20 rounds into this uh, process already. Um, and I'm running a, a 180 grain round, can't talk. I'm running 180 grain uh, round nose soft points out of the Lee Enfield right now because I'm not running FMJs because that's not what this philosophy of use for this rifle is going to be. It's gonna be for general uh, trial carry, defensive purposes out in the wild. and. Uh, so this is good enough. Well, let's take her out to 200 meters and see what happens. At 200 meters, my point of aim should be where my point of impact is. Hopefully the groups aren't too open. Okay, so uh, for this next grouping at 200 meters, I'm going to uh, run a full mag, 10 rounds. And I just want to show you how I'm loading the ammunition into the magazine. Taking very, uh, making very careful I don't get rim lock, which is where I have the rim uh, over top of the round below it. So you can't actually move the round forward. So you want to make sure you avoid rim lock, placing the cartridge in the magazine in front of, and then slip down so that the rim is in front of the uh, rim below it. That has happened to me once. And it happened to me in a moose situation, moose hunting situation. Um, I was new to the Anfields at the time. And uh, I realized that about 10 meters in front of me, there was a moose chewing on willow. And I couldn't see him because we were in willow. And uh, I had rim lock. It was a cow, thank, uh, unfortunately. Maybe fortunately for me because I was so close, I could have reached out and stuck the, the muzzle of my Lee Anfield in, in its ass, really. I mean, it was that close and a very dangerous situation to be in. Um, even with a cow, with a calf. Anyway, that's I'm getting off subject. Um, let's give this a go and see what happens. So what, what we're doing right now is, because this is a relatively new rifle to me, um, testing for function is always a very good idea. So sometimes lo load the mag out, see how it forms, performs. Um, we may need to make a modification to the lips right here. These are the mag lips. If you talk, hear me talking about mag lips, that's what I'm referring to. Is these two little pieces right here. These can be opened up or closed in depending on the type of ammunition that you're running. Essentially for me, if I'm in competition with full metal jacket ammunition, I will run a magazine specifically tailored for that type of ammunition. The, the, uh, the front tabs are closed in more to hold the ammunition more in check. Especially if you're running and the magazine is bouncing up and down, you don't want your ammunition falling out. With soft point ammunition like this one, I tend to have the, uh, the front tabs opened up a bit. Because uh, it's a fatter bullet up front and uh, you need that. Okay, here we go. Let's give this a go. 200 meters. Hopefully I'm not about to embarrass myself and miss the paper altogether. I've got a multiple of uh, excuses for not hitting it. For example, uh, I'm not wearing my eye prescription lenses right now and that black dot looks like a brief, very, very fuzzy gray dot. Here we go. Excuses, right? Always, shooters always have an excuse. Shoot better, suck less. So 
So we're on our way to the 200 meter firing uh, target stands and uh, it just dawned on me. You've probably all watched the uh, Nothing Fancy channel and uh, I've seen him run, running guns and I, I gotta tell you, Nothing Fancy, I really like your channel. Uh, you make it fun for everybody, especially me and that's, that's what it's all about me, right? Anyhow, uh, run and gun. I love it. That's why I go to service rifle matches. It's really the only kind of opportunity I have to go out there and do that. Um, really, like, really like the trail kind of scheme that you use. Um, Valley of Death, the Anvil, all those different things. However, I got one criticism for you, not fancy. I've seen you shoot Model 98 Mausers, military Mausers. I've seen you shoot M1 Grands. Um, but no, the Enfields. Not even one. I mean, the best bolt action battle rifle ever conceived, right? Commonwealth used a lot of them. It's a great effect. And you're not using them in any of your running guns. Is it because uh, they're not made in the USA? <laughs> well, you may be surprised to learn some of them were. Savage Stevens made the, uh, the number four Mark I. Uh, and a number four Mark One star for the uh, Commonwealth. In fact, at the end of the war, Long Branch, the Canadian arsenal that makes all the uh, made all of our Lee Enfields, pretty, pretty much scooped up, slur slur slurped up all of the Savage Stevens parts and assembled them into rifles. I guess it must have been part of the contract. Uh, anyhow, nothing fancy. If you're out there, do you see this? I challenge you to a running gun with Lee Enfields. Heck, they're still in service. It's only a venture service rifle like that that's still in service with the military. 67 years later, they're still running. Yes, they're in service with the Canadian military. Canadian Rangers, you may or may not have seen the logo. I'm one. Proudly serving. Oh boy, here's our 200 meter target. I got the front sight tool. If we need to adjust, we will. I see holes on paper. That's good. I blew a few of the shots, but overall, hopefully, there's at least 10 rounds here. Okay, so anyway, you can see our point of aim, point of impact is supposed to be right about here. The group shifted just a little bit to the left, so I will make a side adjustment, but let's see here. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Did I miss once? Jesus, doesn't like me to miss. I may have missed. Maybe one of these bullet holes is elongated. Anyway, uh, regardless. Okay, let's say I missed. You suck, rifle chair. Um, generally, if it's shooting to the left, you've got to move the front sight to the left. Just. Just a tinge. In fact, I'd almost say don't do it. Just leave it the way it is. But I'm going to because that's who I am. Um, we'll uh, hope that you guys have some questions and I'll be able to answer them. That's kind of it in a nutshell. Uh, I'm going to get out, out of the range here, open up the spot. I can't believe it. A beautiful day like this. Beautiful day like this. I've got the range all to myself. It's not that Canadians don't shoot. They just seem to want to come out and shoot when their weather is really shitty. Because the weather is almost always shitty, except for today. So I guess people are thinking there's too many people at the range, so they're not going to bother coming out. I'm glad I made the time. Anyway, I'll talk back to you here. I'm gonna... Really, did I miss? One, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, nine. I never miss. Okay, we're running out of battery, so we'll end off with a quick rapid fire cereal. Not really aiming at anything in particular. Okay. Here we go.
suck it down, nothing fancy. I forgot to tell you guys something. And these are the measurements for your different front, front sight settings. You will recall when uh, we were on the range, I had a 030 front sight right here. Now we're shooting too low. I'm shooting about an inch and a bit too low. So if each, if there's a variation between each of these sight settings by half, by half an inch and 25 yards, then obviously if I put in a, I put in a zero, okay? Shorter front sight will bring your group up. Taller front sight will bring your group down. If you think about it, it makes sense. So I put in the zero, dead bang on, right where we need it to be. But you can see there's a whole wide assortment of different front sights depending on where you are on this list. Um, you may not have all the different sizes available to you. eBay is your friend. You know that you're at a, a four or five and that you're, you're an inch and a half high. Right, what do you need to do? Which direction do you need to go? You, you, gotta, you need a three sizes taller or sh shorter. You can figure it out. All right, so if you're shooting high, means your blade, your front blade is too low. You need a taller front side to bring it down. Okay, so I've been holding this up here. Hopefully you've had a pencil in hand and you've been writing the measurements down. This is an important piece of information for you. It'll save you a lot of money having this information. That way you don't have to buy all the different sizes and figure it out. If you know what size your front side is and it'll be marked on the front side what size it is, then you know, okay, I'm an inch and a half high. Where do I need to go? I need to buy that specific site now. I know exactly where it is I need to go. I need to go. So, important information. I knew I was forgetting something. Hopefully this helped, guys. Rifle Tour sending off. Here's a, uh, another tidbit for you guys. You notice that those front sights each had a particular height associated with them. Well, you gotta make sure you're, that somebody hasn't taken a file to that front sight and made, and made it shorter. Instead of getting the front sight, quite often people do that. They'll just file them down. Get a micrometer. Before you stick that thing in your rifle, measure the height. Make sure it's the right height. It may be off one or two thou. That's fine. Just make sure somebody hasn't taken it down a lot. Right, okay? Otherwise, you'll be saying, well, Reef Rifle Church said it should have done this. Well, somebody's filed it. Measure the height of these things. You can get micrometers pretty cheap now. They don't cost a lot of money. It's a good investment. Okay. Keep coming back and telling you guys more. I'm sure I'm forgetting something, but just a little bit of advice. Cheers.